Hello. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me again this week. It's good to be back as ever. And um, I wanted to start by saying that um, what I'm going to be doing from now on, as I've been um, telling you about this Patreon site that I've set up, and just to make things easier for me, um, I'll use that to uh, get questions and ideas for topics to speak about. Now, I'm not saying that everyone that uses it has to sign up for a tier. I will actually post publicly um, to get questions and to get suggestions. So please do go over to Patreon just to follow so that at least I can see the things in one in one space, but also I will do my best to continue to, to see things in different areas of social media as well. Um, but if you do have something very specific, I'm going to ask if you can go there uh, so that I can see it more easily. And also, I will prioritize things that are on uh, the Patreon page from now on, just because um, I'm going to be asking deliberately there um, a week in advance as well. I'll be asking straight after this what, what to do for next week, so you'll be able to uh, go over after this live and we'll start to collate ideas so feel free to join the link will be in uh, the description on the youtube video but i'll get the link on the website too so you can join and if you want to follow um, and join patreon please feel free to um, what i will be offering is um, answers to questions that you've got about your language learning, also opportunities to join me live to have chats uh, on Zoom calls and you'll be able to interact with me uh, in a more personalized way. So I'll be able to answer your questions personally for you and um, make sure that I'm giving you uh, all the things that you need in your language journey. So, um, what am I going to talk about today? Very good question. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of um, knowing what we know and what we don't know. <laughs> now, there are a couple of things that I, I sort of spring to mind about this. Um, there's this idea of the imposter syndrome, uh, where people who are actually quite well versed in a number of things feel that they or not they almost feel like they're in they're an imposter in their field they don't really have the the genuine ability to talk on a subject or they feel that they haven't um they're missing something or other people maybe know a lot more than they do and when that may not even be the case um and then the opposite side of that is um what's been referred to many times as this dunning kruger effect now somebody on uh, twitter actually said oh this has been debunked as uh, as a theory the dunning kruger effect um it, it may have been in that sense of the in that sense of the word however i want to kind of just preface this and say i have come across a number of people um who do have this trait of thinking they know an awful lot more than they do after a very short amount of time. And not that this is necessarily a bad thing. So this isn't a, a negative criticism of those people. It's just simply um, an observation that uh, we can often get very excited when we start learning something. We can often get very, uh, feel quite, quite confident. And that's potentially quite a good thing to feel confident with the knowledge that we have means that we can manipulate it and use it very often uh, to uh, make the most of what we what we know. So in no way am I saying that one of these is positive and one of these is negative. This is, these are just simple observations of, of us as human beings. But it does have an impact on the perceptions that people have of us, and it does have an it does have an impact on what we can actually do with the language. Um, the first thing, I mean, with uh, what we know and what we don't know, at first sight, it can seem quite difficult to know what what we don't know because if we don't know what that is, how do we know what we don't know? And therein lies the dilemma. <laughs> um, 
we don't always know what we don't know, especially when it comes to new grammar, new languages with new vocabularies and different structures. It can be quite confusing. And I did get some um, responses from the question about this. So I just want to sort of um, go through those first and see what they say. So I have one. I go with Socrates. I know that I know that I don't know. There will always be something I have to learn or relearn. And yes, that's absolutely true. No matter where you are on the scale of whether you feel that you're an imposter and you actually have quite quite a good amount of knowledge on a topic uh, or whether you uh, feel more like yeah, you feel very confident very quickly with uh, a more limited uh, amount of knowledge on a given topic but you're not aware of um, of what you don't know. Uh, someone says here, by talking to myself and seeing where I don't have words uh, or correct tenses, yep, that can be a really good way of seeing what we don't know. So getting an idea of what topics can we actually talk about? What kind of things do we know how to say? Are they the things that we need to be able to say to get across our point on uh, about our lives, about our situation. Can we do all of those things? If we can't, then maybe there's room to grow and we can definitely get those basic things down pat. Um, and absolutely, I mean, as I've said many times before, and I'll, it's worth repeating, that once we can get to grips with the basics of a language and we can get our point across about uh, our situation and the things that are important to us, Really, we're talking about kind of a tail end of A2, B1, and, and into B2 levels. We're talking about that kind of level where we can do that kind of stuff, or we can at least start doing that kind of stuff. Um, so just for anybody who's sort of fixated on the, the C1 and C2 levels, um, this is kind of uh, way beyond what, what I'm talking about in terms of general conversation, usually. Um, okay. Here's another one, by writing the language. Yeah, that's a very good way of doing it. So if you write the language down and you try to use it, whether you're talking, whether you're writing, and you can start to notice what you find difficult to express. And definitely that's a good way of identifying what you don't, don't know and what you do know. Uh, uh, okay, I have one here. I don't know what I don't want to know. I don't, <laughs> that sounds even more complicated than the initial question, not knowing about what you don't want to know. Um, but yeah, you, you may come across things that you don't particularly need or want to know, absolutely. Um, Olaf says to here, it depends on the what. We all have different indicators or signals that help us to decide. Yes, it does definitely depend on the what, I agree. Um, but there's, uh, some things we potentially don't need to know or won't remember because we don't get to repeat those things. And so I guess what I'm talking about more here is um, awareness of even things that we don't particularly want to be able to talk about, but we're just aware of where we are in that space of knowledge. Um, there we go. When I personalize the content, use grammar rules with personal information or situations. Absolutely. Yeah, when you can do that, then you, you're, you're on a good, you're in a good place there to, to move forward. So, yeah, I agree that um, that's a good way to know where you are and where, you, where you're headed. And I'm going to finish with this one from the comments that I got, which I think is absolutely true for many people. The more I know, the more I know that I do not know. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And this is why I think it leads to this um, issue with um, imposter syndrome, because we feel that we know just how lit how much there is to know about any given topic. And that's true. Now, these are the things why I sort of wanted to raise this as, as an issue today. I think all of the advice that um, that you've given from here is, is great in terms of uh, talking to yourself, trying to write things, trying to um, have a good think and even make notes on what you can and can't say, what you can and can't express in a language. Very, very important. Um, 
Are there gaps? Are there things that you would like to be able to say? And you'll start to see how much of the language there is to learn. Now, a language is generally a very big thing. So um, you don't necessarily need to know all of it to be able to start using it and start expressing yourself. So let's just sort of start with the 100% of the language, right? The 100% of a language is like sort of wow up here somewhere, okay? It's just like over above the heavens. And, um, and, and that's when someone says to me, I want to learn all of a language. Um, my response is always, I don't know if anyone ever really does that, even with their own first language. So let's just take that off the table for a minute. But if we want to get quite, you know, quite good at a language um, and we want to be more than just sort of getting by, there are many, many levels to this. I mean, there are people who study and research, do PhDs in, you know, the the types of language used in, in literature and in poetry or in how language has evolved, um, how language uh, has gone from, you sort of, you know, um, grown out of another language or uh, um, the parent language, for example, or how it relates to other languages. And so there are definitely going to be people out there who have this sort of very wide um, and breadth of knowledge about a given language. And so that's really, really good. What I'm going to say as well is <laughs> that even that even though that is really really wonderful to have and it's definitely a great um thing to aim for if that's your goal it doesn't have to be everyone's goal and the reason i say that is that being able to have a basic conversation in a language can be a goal in a, in its own right as long as we're aware of, of that's what we're doing so we don't get sort of it, it, well, we, we, we can we can get negative um, feedback or comments, and I see this quite a lot online. Uh, this person only knows a few words and they can't really speak the language. And actually what they could be able to do is get by quite fine for what they need the language for. So um, we, we can have that as a goal. If we want to have a higher goal, looking at this sort of PhD going into um, you know, real research, language research, doesn't have to be that extreme, okay, that we need to head, head for. We can go for some sort of middle ground. Now, languages, um, not only do they have lots of words for common everyday objects, but they also have idioms, they also have slang, they also have um, other uh, sort of different types of dialects or accents or you name it, sort of languages across the world will have these different variations and different levels to them that will uh, make acquiring all of that knowledge um, really a lifelong journey. So you never really get to the end of that, even if it's your first language, you never really get to the end of that process. There's always going to be something new to learn and languages evolve and change. So there are going to be uh, things that change with the language that you'll have to get used to too. The other side of the coin, apart from the sort of the, the comments about uh, people not really speaking a language when in fact they can get by, uh, which I, again, I think is absolutely fine as a goal. Um, the other side of the coin that I see is uh, people out there who feel that they have to get to complete domination, sort of dominate the language, master the language, to be able to make it a valid goal. Um, it's a personal choice. I would say that just because we master one language or we get to a very high level in one language does not negate the value in uh, achieving a lower level um, for, uh, for for learning. So just because you've done your PhD in 18th century French literature and you, you know all about that very, very well and you know an awful lot of stuff about French, um, just because you learn um, a lower level of Spanish or Chinese or another language does not negate the knowledge of your French and it doesn't mean that um, sorry, it doesn't negate the, the 
you know the the need or the or the validity in learning uh, that other language to a lower level. You don't necessarily need it. You could also be quite happy just chit chatting uh, with people in that other language without having to go into great depth. Of course, perceptions of when we speak a language to a a lower level uh, for people going to the country and speaking and interacting. Of course, you're not going to be able to have the precision that you may have in one or more languages that you do speak very very well and that's something we have to come to terms with it's not going to be necessarily an option to to choose words in the same way as we might be used to in other languages um and that's something that i think psychologically we need to um come sort of yeah, make peace with and uh get used to that idea of okay um i'm choosing to do it this way or it was going to take time so uh, we'll have to get there. So the feeling of that sort of, and I've almost hear, heard it described as almost hopelessness when you've learnt a language or a couple of languages to a very high level um, of how on earth do I get to that level in this new language? And this is where I say you don't need to necessarily. So if you're on that side of the scale and you worry about that, then I'd say yeah um it's something you need to make a decision uh, you can feel that you never want to do that and that's absolutely fine but you could also just get used to the idea of you have these languages here that you've you've been learning very well and then the other languages might come or the other language may come a bit further down um yeah so <laughs> the other side of the coin of this with the with people who who feel that they do know a lot um, and maybe they haven't studied that much yet, um, but they're not aware of what they haven't studied because they're not aware of the grammar they don't know and they're not aware of the vocabulary they don't know. They're not aware it exists. They're not aware of the idioms. They're not aware of the turns of phrase. They're not aware of the slang. They're not aware of the different dialects. Or they may even have a passing base awareness of those, but more often than not, they don't. Um, and for those people, um, there's actually no problem with knowing what they know if they feel happy and confident. As I said, the, the issue I see that comes up are more frustrations from other people. And so frustrations that, oh my word, does this person really know the thing? So we feel the imposter syndrome again, or um a frustration of this person needs to know what they don't know so we have to go and sort of beat them overhead with a stick it's almost to sort of get them to understand what they don't know uh i personally don't see much um currency in doing that uh simply because they're not likely to get very much more out of that than what they get out of it already so it doesn't really affect necessarily affect other people um us if we if we feel that we do know more um it all it does is their excitement uh their enthusiasm can possibly inspire other people to learn uh because they talk about it and that's good the ability to just start putting things together and going for it uh, can actually inspire other people to do a similar thing whether they've got more knowledge of the language or less uh, but you don't actually really you're not going to get a job necessarily just because you can you can do this and you can you feel confident in the in in the in the basics that you've you've learned so um, you know, if you go for a job interview, as as I've done in the past, and I have to do the interview in the language that I'm going to use, I, I can't just speak a basic level of the language and expect to to work with clients or to to, to do something like with the language. It's just not it's not going to happen. And I've had situations where I've interviewed people who who haven't. Um, had the that that knowledge of that awareness of the language and thought they had and yeah that we, we don't offer them the job 
um it's it's just as simple as that the language isn't sufficient so <laughs> i guess what i want to say as a conclusion to this is being happy in what you do and being happy and knowing what you know in terms of writing things down making sure you can say the things that you want to say is really important in the first instance the second instance be happy with your own journey and where that leads you what other people are doing is what other people are doing and they'll just sort of go off and do their own things but you're the one that's important what you're doing is the thing that counts and your own goals are the things that we care about because your goals and what you're doing and your achievements have um have the most impact on you um not just for your languages but also for your well-being and for your own particular situation and other people's goals achievements uh, don't really come into it unless we let them uh, by you know feeling feeling bad about it or whatever else but actually none of that will change who we are and what we're doing i hope, I hope that makes sense um i'm gonna have a look and see how this so let me see there are quite a few questions i think coming in and i haven't answered them yet but this is sort of the way i've always been doing this is this with the idea of, of just talking first so yeah the, this topic i always find quite i'd be interested to see what you think of this do i use anki i don't really use anki no um i have had spates of using anki um in the past but i don't really use it um I find a bit like when I do test myself on on certain apps that I get good at the test, but I don't necessarily get good at really incorporating the language into my own language. So I, I, I can see how they work well for other people. For me personally, I prefer if I'm going to do that kind of thing, I prefer a pen and paper and I just write it down. I'm a little bit old fashioned with those kinds of things. Um, how to spread Hausa language um good question um i think talking at an event about the language giving some some lessons or something like that is always a good idea so um uh, anyone well i'm always um very happy to have people speak about african languages at the polyglot conference and so that might be an option for example um yeah i, th I think doing something like that will help and get more people involved in, in learning. Yeah. So that, that could be a cool option. Um, let me see. I can see any other questions. Salam, Richard, salam. <laughs> salam, aslam. Okay, let me see. Please talk about how to find money through languages next time okay i'll i'll try and remember to to do that uh for you uh about making money um okay i've got a feeling that i have talked about that before but i'll i'll see if i can if if, if you want that then i can have a look at how i can incorporate that i'm always trying watching uh movies and and see how much i don't uh understand and um, that's on the topics um yeah that's a good so when you see things when you hear or see things or read things even as well yeah it's a good way of checking your understanding and your knowledge um i think if you're not understanding the tv or a film or yeah a, a book generally then then yeah there's there's a way to go before we can feel that we really have internalized a lot enough of the language uh, to to make it make sense really with a kind of a b2 level i think that you can follow quite a lot of stuff already um i've always struggled uh with that i approved okay i achieved the c2 in english and i always feel like i'm lacking with my other languages 
yeah even my native one spanish yeah it's it's very common it's actually quite a common issue that i come across uh, that's why i wanted this as a topic today because it's it's quite a difficult topic to talk about but it's um in terms of getting all the information in it um but yeah i come across this quite a lot from both sides actually um and people getting very frustrated by other people who um have opposite opposing views um on on the topic too but yeah i mean it's it's it is good points i'm often guilty of downplaying the fluency uh okay yeah i've heard that as well quite a few times um when i'm in conversations and confronted with with content i don't understand yeah i mean look it's normal to have things even at a very advanced level in a language it's quite normal to have things that you don't know um you haven't come across um we can't have come across every single thing in any language it's um it's just not not realistic so yeah i love how richard you never uh dismisses non-fluent knowledge of languages uh i still appreciate your competence even if you're on a1 a2 absolutely absolutely it's such an achievement to get to it having been through the whole process of like doing an a1 exam or a B and a, an a2 exam my word it's so much effort for me it takes so long for me to do it so um yeah absolutely a1 and a2 then wait i think that people really underestimate them um this is my honest genuine, but like the real, my opinion is that people underestimate what goes into these levels. I mean, you know, an A1 level or an A2 level is not like a week's worth of study, it's just not. <laughs> I don't know where, and I see this quite often where people say, oh yeah, I've done, I've done like two weeks of this language and now I'm at, at an A2 and I'm like, mm, yeah, unless like you speak a language that's very, very similar. And even then it might be quite a challenge to be really an A1 or A2 after a week or two weeks. You might be able to fudge um, a variation of the language from the other linguistic knowledge you have, but with a, a genuine, a true A1, A2 level, it takes a while and there's a lot of vocabulary and, and sort of to get that right takes time. Um, so that's why I always find it quite hard when people ask me what level are you at in some languages. Sometimes I find that quite hard because for listening, for example, and reading, I definitely can understand a lot more in some languages than I can actually actively say or or or, read, or uh, write. But um, it's a super difficult thing to to sort of quantify. I find so yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I mean, I I've, I've been doing what. Irish for what, five months and I'm just coming to the end of A1, the A1 course in Irish after five months of three hours a week of study and then revision and stuff in between and it's taken me five months um, and for Cornish I've been doing it for longer and I'm just about to finish kind of like an A2 level in Cornish but my Cornish isn't beyond like A2. Uh, I mean, at A2 now, right, if somebody asks me a question in Cornish, I can answer and I could tell you bits about myself and I could talk about things going on and I can understand certain things. But uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of A2 um, where I am. So yeah, I absolutely um, appreciate A2. A2 is great. A2 can get you way further than, than, you, than a lot of people think. Um, especially if you've learned a lot, all the stuff that's in A2 as well. I mean, you know, there is a difference, I guess, as well. You, like when, when, we, when we did the, the, the Turk, Turk, Turkish exams for A2, I did Turkish and I learned everything that I had to learn for A2. So my, my, my mark in the exam was around, I think it was like 96% for A2. And, but some people just barely passed, right, in the class and got like maybe 62 was the pass rate. 30% difference in an exam is a lot. And so if you have 30% difference of knowledge at an A2 level, the person who just passed the A2 level obviously will not be able to say as much as I was able to say, passing it at 96%, whatever it was. So, of course, there's, there's a difference even within an A2 level, right? But um, you can do quite a lot with A2 if you know all the stuff at A2. Uh, have you put Korean aside? 
Um, how was your experience overall? I haven't actually put Korean aside yet. No. Um, funnily enough, I had planned to, but I really like my group on on Clubhouse, and and so I'm sticking with it for now. Um, in fact, I've got a, a meeting tonight uh, for for it. Last week, I couldn't join my groups because we had a number of things going on. I had uh, some interviews externally, and I had. Um, what was I doing? I was away one day, uh, so I couldn't do it. And so, yeah, there were, and then and then we had that some a birthday party or something in the evening one 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 day as well. So I couldn't join um, for some of the well any of the days last week. But yeah, generally speaking, I go to these to these meetings like four times a week for Korean, and my Korean is still absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's really really bad my korean's terrible it's it's i feel i feel bad for the korean people i'm so sorry if any of you ever hear me murdering your language please accept my apologies in advance but i i absolutely i really like it i really like um i like the group that i'm in and i enjoy the social element of it and i'm learning some korean and i kind of set myself this goal in the end not to worry about getting too far with korean just to be a bit more familiar with the language and how it works and that definitely worked but yeah I'm, it's going to be a slow burn for a long time i think to get anywhere with it so thank you for asking and remembering like about korean Speaking of well, well-being, FLA, foreign language acquisition, can reduce the symptoms of depression. Yes, absolutely. I'm sure it can, um, especially when it's going really, really well. The thing is, depression can impact on foreign language learning, which is, uh, and foreign language learning without the human element, as in we don't allow ourselves time to be sick or we don't allow ourselves time to be busy or to not have time and we don't forgive ourselves or make promises to ourselves to allow ourselves time to recuperate sometimes i see that having a negative impact if we don't do that on on depression or any other issues we have because then we feel guilt in addition to the depression or the sickness or um the lack of time we also feel guilt that we've missed study periods and i never ever want you any of you to feel guilty about that i've had periods of time where i have to stop give myself space take a deep breath and go back to the language later but i always 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 tell give myself permission to do that first of all i don't just stop i i say to myself okay things aren't in a position right now for me to do this i'm taking a week off or i'm taking two weeks off Last year, I took two months off of Korean because I was in a situation where I could I couldn't do it. So, do that. Be 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 fair to yourself. I think sometimes as well, what we do um, is we treat ourselves more harshly than we treat another person. And I always say, would you tell somebody else to do what you're telling yourself to do? Would you tell them to feel guilty? Would you tell them they're bad? Would you tell them to carry on doing it even if they're not well or they're feeling, you know, they're feeling depressed or they're going through a, a rough time or they're super busy and they're tired? Would you make somebody do that? Would you tell them they're bad for not doing it? Absolutely not. No, I mean, unless you're <laughs> unless you just like seeing people suffer, of course you wouldn't. Um, so I ask you to treat yourself with the same kindness that you would treat other people and allow yourself time to to be well and if we're not well you know mentally and physically um well as well as we normally are right how do we expect ourselves to to perform to meet these goals maybe we just need some time to do something passive or like just listening to something or to make an agreement to do nothing and then to review afterwards we need to change our goals and let them vary with time so the the groups that i work with and the individuals i work with uh, what we do is we talk about this quite openly and some weeks we will say actually this week don't study just take it easy you need time and there's something quite powerful about doing that about giving yourself permission and allowing yourself that space and time that you need. So yeah, please, all. whenever I'm talking about language learning, um, 
this isn't some sort of weird race that we all have to sort of, you know, go a, a gazillion miles an hour across the finish line. It's that's not the point. We we've got to stay. We've got to stay healthy as well. We've got to, you know, we've got, we've got to look after ourselves. Okay. Um, so let me just see. I'm just trying to see if I've got any more questions here on Harriet. What are your top three ways to find native speakers to interact with practice? Uh, speaking native speakers are really overrated. <laughs> Like native, I I I don't necessarily look for na what native speakers. Um, I mean, I talk about native level speakers first of all. The reason I do that is because um, the term native speaker in my country is actually um, can be discriminatory. Um, I know it's used a lot, and I know we're used to hearing and reading and seeing native speaker as a thing that people look for. And the reason it's a discriminatory. Um, thing is that some people speak a language to a native level but they don't count that language as their native language they may have a different language that they can count as their native language or their mother tongue so i always talk about native level uh, speakers uh, for me that's an important distinction to make so that we include as many of the native level speakers as possible even if i talk about those people <laughs> and include everyone I still don't necessarily look for those people. Um, the reason is, is that they don't necessarily have the experience of learning the language. They don't necessarily have the ability to explain the language um, in a way that somebody who's been through the process and knows the language well, but learns it later in life. And so I'm a big fan of interacting with people who know the language and not necessarily if they are native level, but they they know the language. So, and to do that, I yeah, use many different places. So, I mean, I've come across lots of people who study language or speak the language already on, on italki, uh, which I use for a number of languages and uh, to teach and to uh, have conversation practice with me. Um, in fact, I mean, I do have that link that I put on my YouTube videos and in different places for a discount if you're interested in, in um, italki and you can use my name if you write Richard at the end of um, when you go to buy credits or whatever for your first italki lesson, you get you get some money off. I think if you use both the link and my name, you get like $15 for free. Um, so there's that then there's also places like clubhouse there are places like helocal uh places people some people use hello talk some people have mixed views because you get quite a lot of people who who are there for other things than languages and yeah it can get a bit creepy um see my my thought on all of this is i'm kind of i'm here to talk about languages i'm here to talk about in and in different languages i'm kind of not <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the fact that I'm married, I'm not on the. I'm, I'm not interested in in the other stuff, right? And I think some people use or see Hello Talk for these other uh, things. Um, but anyway, um, I've I've heard mixed mixed thoughts and reviews and uh, on on this. But apparently, there's a way to block certain uh, things. So it tends to be the, the the boys or the men that are the worst culprits for this. Um, but um, you can always just, uh, if, if you, if you uh, are not male and you just want to get on to find people, then uh, one way you can do is just actually, sorry, genuine men out there who, who of, of which there are many, um, but you can actually just say that you're looking for um, somebody of, this, of, of, of uh, not male to to reduce the chances of you getting that kind of uh, disruption um i'm not going to suggest that everyone does that but if if it's a particular issue for you that's one way of apparently of getting around it um so yeah it's something i've heard some people do to uh, to overcome these issues um hello 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 wow i've got so many um actually i've been studying turkish i've got 
a level B1, but took a lot of time as well. Thank you for saying that. It did take me a long time to get to a B1 level in Turkish. Absolutely. It took me, it took me years. It took me like, it took me, it took me like then it got two years of study to get to B1. I mean, and I did an intensive course of Turkish over those two years. It took me a long time. Um, yeah. I'm so glad I'm seeing some exa uh, nice comments about, yeah, the, the overworking and depression and stuff. Yeah. You've got to take care of yourselves. You, you mean more than anything else, right? You're more important than any language. Um, and I know that sounds a bit, possibly sounds a bit strange coming from someone who's just here for languages, but I, I, I would care more for your well-being than I would about your language goals and you're way more important than that so it's kind of it's no for me it's a no-brainer and I don't know who needs to hear me say that but it, it's true uh, you're worth way more than than any language or any language goals okay so look after yourselves first um because I need you I need I need you to be around to be talking to us and to to interact with us and to be in the community and what your goals and what you're doing at the moment are secondary uh, the fact that you're with us is the most important thing okay i've uh yeah i've seen too many too many people um leave the planet sooner than i'd hoped to yeah to not pay attention to to say that you're you're way way more uh, worthwhile and worthful and you're you worth you're just worth way more than than anything uh related to any other thing like languages or anything like that so please do take care um do i use special repetition uh, as a way for learning languages um special repetition spatial or sp oh, I, I read that as special spaced repetition <laughs> sorry yes and no this is where i wish english i wish english had this word for um yeah, yain in German, yes and no. Um, so I, I often set myself goals to to reuse words and to use them again. So I tend to do it automatically, but um, not not in the sense of I think you're talking about in, um, in, in kind of a thing like Anki. But um, yeah, I tend to allow words to come back. I mean, I... I'm, I'm also in a bit of a strange, um, a strange or different uh, part of my learning uh, and my life. I've been through the whole go to university, study languages, get a degree, live in different countries, work, study abroad. I've, I've kind of been there, done that and got the T-shirt. And now I tend to just enjoy language learning for, for fun. And um, if I get good um, at a language uh, then great if i get to where i want to be with the language fantastic as well if i don't quite make it and i reassess my goals and then set myself new goals like with korean <laughs> then that's also fine it's all good um it all adds to your your whole and your understanding of other people and other places and on the planet and other cultures and and often also your own culture and your own language. It can often help with that kind of stuff too, which I think is cool. Hey Richard, can you speak Greek? Yeah, I can speak some Greek. Um, I uh, studied Greek uh, for a while. I'm not amazing at Greek um, by any sense of the imagination, but I can definitely get by in Greek. Like I, as in I go to Greece and I speak Greek um, with, with locals. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. I start off war, um, wanting to know everything, and as soon as it become, I hope I know enough to get uh, there when I travel. Yeah, Scott, I feel you there. Absolutely. Yeah, sometimes we just we need to reduce or, or change our goals. We start off with very crazy goals sometimes, and we need to just get them in in a more manageable position. So I get that. And I hope you're happy, healthy, happy New Year. Have you seen the new APP Jump Speak? No, I haven't seen the new. Oh, the AP app, app Jump Speak. No, I haven't. But I'll have to make a note of that and, and check it out. Thank you for for mentioning it, Greg. 
I, I don't know it. Um, I did come across a new app, actually, that I will share with you. And it's on the phone now and I can't show you. But there's a, there was an app I came across with um, with lots of videos and they have them for French, Spanish, Ital French, Spanish Italian and German, I think it's. Um, what's it called? Oh, my word, I'm not going to remember it now, but I've got it installed. I'll write it in the in the description, OK, uh, on the YouTube video so you can check it out. If you're interested in the app, I'll figure it out and, and write it in later. Um, OK, it's possible to get some uh, vocabulary in two weeks, but still not enough to get to A1. Absolutely, Svetlana. Yeah, I think this is the thing is we think A1 is is like nothing and it's not nothing. It's there's a lot into into A1. Um, would you consider someone that passed a one test a false beginner? I know some people who are like B1 level going into complete beginners courses because they're, they're scared to go on to certain classes. Um, a1, A1 level, typically, if you went to university, for example, they often have this kind of false beginners group. Um, and yes, that would possibly fall under that. But that would be then going on a course with a very different tempo, right? So that would often be that kind of thing, yeah. Um, do I personally uh, consider A1 to be false beginners? No, I think false beginners almost sounds like a bit, I think it feels a bit derogatory for me. Um, so I don't think I'd use that 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 myself. Um, I get what's meant by it, and I don't feel offended or anything myself personally. But I think if if I were to if I were to call someone a false beginner, and they passed their A one exam, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable saying that to them. Um, and I don't know how I'd feel if someone said to me, "You're a beginner, like a false beginner." If I put all that work in myself, someone said to me, "You're a false beginner," because it would feel a bit that like you're negating the the effort that went into it. Um, but yeah, university, I have seen that happen. And um, but generally speaking, I uh, I'd struggle. I would say a false beginner from from my point of view would be someone who's learned a few basic phrases um, just by going on holiday for a few weeks, or they they picked up a travel book and um, or did the first three lessons of a teach yourself course or something like that, and didn't go any further. That would probably be more a false beginner, I guess, if I were to use the term uh, in my eyes than than say an A1 level, which goes way beyond um, doing the first three letters, uh, chapters of a, of, of a course. Um, Korean is hard. No matter how lovely your teacher and and the works, it's hard to get, uh, yeah, it's hard to help you. Yeah, it, it just takes time to get the things in your head with Korean. It just does. There's no, there are only two ways about it. It takes time. Um, there are only 23 people on chat and you don't answer questions that are being displayed. I cannot see in the chat the questions you're answering. Is it actually live or prepared beforehand? Kevin, um, so I'm chatting on two channels. I'm on Instagram and on YouTube at the same time. So I'm going through the YouTube ones now, but I went through the Instagram ones first uh, this time. Usually I do it the other way around, but um, I decided today I would give the Instagram people <laughs> some uh, extra attention. So yeah, no, it's not it's not um, a beforehand thing. I do sometimes get some questions that I answer beforehand before I come to the live questions, but I am um, looking at the live questions now. Uh, what's a typical day for you walking down the street and being able to listen to all these conversations and being able to interpret multiple meanings that can't be conveyed in English? Good question. Um, nowadays, nowadays, especially with co the whole COVID thing, it's uh, it tends to only really be um, Macedonian, Albanian, Turkish, uh, Serbian, Croatian, and uh, Bulgarian, and this year, this last two last two years. I haven't really been to Greece so uh, very much at all. 
Um, usually I go to Greece quite often, but not this year. Um, but those languages, yes. And I'm kind of very, very used to that now. It's um, very, very normal for me. Um, and then I kind of pick up, so yeah, I pick up bits of conversations as I walk. It's a bit like a radio, you know, when you turn the, the, the dial on a radio and you start, um, you start picking up on different radio stations in different languages. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what's, what's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, but the, in, in Czech Republic, I, when I lived there and there were lots of people crossing over Charles bridge, for example, speaking different languages, sometimes I'd actually have a headache because my brain would, would, um, listen. I just naturally I'd be listening or hearing different languages. Um, and yeah, that was pretty, it was pretty crazy, uh, sometimes because I'd hear so many, um, languages and it would be, yeah, my brain would just naturally float from one to the other. Um, let's see. Compassion towards oneself is huge. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah, you're very welcome, Greg. Kevin, Kevin Marcus, you, I don't know. Um, okay. I, I'm sure this is not live. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not so sure what the what the thing about me being live is, but it's definitely live. It's just that there are lots of questions uh, on YouTube, on YouTube, but also on Instagram. So I'm trying to get through them all. Um, bear with me, Kevin. <laughs> if you've got a question, you feel free to ask. But at the moment, I'm not seeing any any questions from you. Just comments about me being live or not. Um, let me see. I have been there sometimes it speaks about topics for about 30 minutes and then answers the questions on YouTube. And it's, thank you, Svetlana, for answering that. Um, but, but I've been studying um, Italian for two weeks. Although I have a lot of comp comp uh, comprehensible input, I often fall into temptation to learn a few topics of grammar. Would it be a problem to acquire a, la a language? Um, I'm not quite sure what you're asking me, actually. I'm studying Italian for two weeks. I have a lot of comprehensible input. Okay. I often fall, feel the temptation to learn a few topics. Of, oh, my word. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't advocate not doing grammar. Um, so there are many, many things that work for different people. Okay. And if you're one of those people that you just like want to read and that's it, and you don't want to do anything else, Go, go for that but if you want to learn grammar and you want to study it grammar is a great tool to use to to understand things really quickly i mean it's designed for that right to describe how the language works so if you want to learn using grammar and like read the rules and read the explanations go for it seriously i mean i do it i absolutely do it i don't just read in a language i definitely study like how the structure of the language um okay uh, yes, but what, Kevin, what confuses me is that he doesn't answer the questions from chat. He's answering questions that are not being asked on chat. Kevin, they are. <laughs> They're all in chat. Kevin, feel free to ask me a question. And when, when I get to the bottom, I'll probably see it, hopefully. Uh, what are your thoughts on Russia and Ukraine? I think it's extremely sad, um, like most people, uh, I guess. Um, um, uh, I don't have really the words to describe how sad it is. The situation is absolutely drastic and dreadful. And um, yeah, I mean, my heart goes out to the people who are being affected by this. Um, yeah, I find it very sad um, to see what's going on. And I have friends and people I know um, and in in this situation right now who are reporting on facebook and sharing what's going on and uh friends who have got family still in 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 ukraine and yeah i mean what can i say it's it's dreadful um yeah uh, i mean I'm, I'm i'll move on to language again because i i kind of i think that i'll leave it to the news i'm not going to report on um, on things that I see and hear, I don't know if that's my place. And uh, but 
of course, I'm very, very sad um, to see this happening. It's it's just uh, it's horrible. Um, okay, uh, Svetlana, I've lived in Portugal for 17 years. I've been living in England for 18 years, and uh, nobody brags about being a native speaker of Portuguese or English. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I only speak uh, ladies' um, old partner because some men, some men are not all there uh, for other things. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm heading out of here since it's weird how listening to live which is not actually live my word kevin <laughs> so kevin managed to get to a live and complain about him not thinking it's live because he couldn't understand it and then disappearing because and not asking a question because he didn't know it's live i think possibly um we need to say bye bye to kevin <laughs> This is weird. Bye bye, Kevin. <laughs> have, have a very nice day. Um, okay. That's odd. I find I find it very odd. Anyway. Um salam, salam. So the video app you mentioned is it Chatterbug? Yes, it is Chatterbug. That is it. It's Chatterbug, yes. And it's it's got some cool. I recommended it to someone I know learning French and said, you know, you might be interested in looking at Chatterbug. I saw it came up on my on my Instagram feed and um, and I looked at it, downloaded it and looked at it and I thought actually this is pretty cool for people starting out in in these languages. And I think there are even I mean I don't know it says, it says advanced, but the advanced videos I saw I'm not sure how advanced they are. The one that I saw was very, very slow. Like the speech was very slow. And when I see advanced written anywhere, I, I usually expect it to be quite almost like normal speed, but it felt very slow. But there was a lot of really cool stuff on it. Um, so for, definitely for beginners, possibly, possibly more than that as well. Um, let me see. Richard, you once said that you had access to special documents for studying Russian and, professor, and the professor allowed you to copy the website, which was shutting. Are you please able to share this? Special documents. Makes me sound like James Bond. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that is. I have no idea. I have no idea what that is or was. Sorry, I don't know. I don't have, I don't remember what that, that could be. Sorry, 008, I've just seen no. 008, exactly. 008 is late to the party. Okay. Do you still have trouble understanding certain languages that you know well? I don't. Do I have difficulty understanding languages that I still, that I know well? Um. I don't know, that feels like a bit of a paradox in some way. Because I wouldn't describe the language as knowing it well if I didn't understand it well, if that makes sense. So I guess, no. Languages that I know, 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 know particularly well, no, I don't tend to have issues with, with understanding, particularly like normal stuff, right? I mean, like watching TV, watching pretty much anything, news reports, whatever you want. So I kind of, yeah. Yeah, um, no, I don't. And not the ones that I, I know really well. Uh, do you know any resources to learn Albanian? Okay, the one thing that I could find is Colloquial and Hippocrine. Uh, which resources would you recommend? Thank you for your help. Uh, yes, I do have recommendations for Albanian. Absolutely. Um, language very dear to my heart. Uh, so let me see if I can. There's one. So, first of all, Colloquial Albanian, um, the new version, the latest version of Colloquial Albanian, not the one that was written by, uh, sort of with the dark blue um, cover, the latest one. That version is pretty good. Um, okay, that's pretty good. It's a lot better than the old version. Um, and now this is not going to let me show you um 
There is a book called Discovering Albanian, which is pretty good. Although, <laughs> although there aren't many resources right for this language, but Discovering Albanian I like generally. But there are some notes in there about the type of Albanian that's spoken here that I asked Albanian speaking friends, have you ever heard anyone say this? Because I haven't. And they said no. <laughs> so that kind of freaked me out a little bit because I thought, okay, well, I'm, I know I'm, I'm, you know, my Albanian's okay, but it's not, it's not amazing. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll ask Albanian speaking friends. And no, they, they never heard of it. I think there were like things to do with the months. They had these different month forms in there. And it's like, I've never heard anyone say these things. Because um, the Albanian people will speak here, for example, uh, tends to be mixed a lot with some Serbian or Macedonian. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is why I think some Albanians from Albania might find it harder to understand. And we use a lot more Turkish words here as well than, say, in Albania. Um, although Albanians, there are Albanians that do use Turkish words, but they tend to go more towards the the, the Albanian Albanian. Uh, there are other books as well. So there's this one that I've got on my shelf. I'm just thinking, I've got quite a few for Albanian because I just basically bought every single book I could find. I got this one in London, I think, years ago. But then the other ones I have, one of them's in Macedonian and it's um, not available um, in other countries. In fact, I've got two or three that are just in Macedonian. Um, because I first started learning Albanian through Macedonian, not through English. Um, but yeah, there's, there was this one. I don't. I never actually used it in the end. Um, but I liked the look of it, and I just liked having <laughs> more resources in Albanian. Um, but yeah, colloquial Albanian and discovering Albanian are the ones I'm going to say. Um, uh, discovering Albanian for me is was really good. Okay. Are you C2 in Macedonian? Um, well, it's my home language. I've been speaking it since I was, well, what, for 17, well, I want to say, yeah, 17 years I've been speaking Macedonian as a home language. Well, yeah, roughly. So it's a long time to speak a language. There is no C2 exam for me to say I'm a C2, official C2 level speaker of language. But yeah, I mean, I, I know a lot of stuff in Macedonian at this point i mean as a as somebody who's not wasn't born and using it and speaking it for at home um i mean there's it's it would be rare that i would hear something that i don't understand for example in like normal daily life or even to do with like medical stuff or whatever else or things about economics or whatever what a lot of what i can do in english i could do in macedonian very very easily um some things in macedonian actually to do with particularly buildings like um, knowing how to describe uh processes for building things uh, the the component parts of a build i would feel more comfortable listening to that sometimes in macedonian uh, just because i've had a lot of experience with people talking about that um in macedonian and when i when i when I left the UK, I was kind of in my 20s and uh, early 20s. And so I didn't really have that experience in the same way as I had in Macedonian. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, with, with, with these types of levels, it, it's they almost become a bit weird. But, yeah, I, I guess <laughs> if a C2 existed, it yeah, I guess. Um, uh, okay, let me see. To the way includes native speaker recordings. Okay, let me, I only ask. I feel like my grasp of French is decent, but things still uh, throw me off. I feel like I need to think in French more. I like don't translate in my head from French to English. Yeah, that's. Um, I. I uh, Yeah, not translating is 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 definitely better for being able to um, get that kind of fluency in your speech uh, for sure. I I can't think quickly enough to translate in my head. Um, 
I, I've never I've never really been able to do that so well. So, uh, but yeah, I would I would agree that, that that's that's it's a good it's a good thing if you want to feel that you're accessing the language directly and straight away and going for it. Uh, Richard, who is the greatest polyglot nowadays, in your opinion? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, there are so many really good people out there. And um, um, to be honest, I, I don't I don't know if I, I don't even know how how important that would be for me at this point um, to worry about uh, about that. But but yeah, I, I mean, there are lots of really good people out there. Saludos de México. Uh, saludos. Muchas gracias. Uh, let me see. Do you speak or understand Ukrainian? I do understand Ukrainian, yes. Um, I do understand it, but I don't speak it. Um, I I understand a lot of Ukrainian because I studied Czech and Polish and some Slovak and um, and also uh, Russian. Uh, so the the language is kind of has have, they have a lot in common. I have been through all of. Um, the link stories in, in Ukrainian and Belarusian, uh, just because I wanted to sort of hear how it sounded and, and listen to it. So I did all of those, um, but I haven't really properly studied Ukrainian. Um, I find that I would probably just end up mixing it up with other languages that I speak. So I've, I've not, or it would just end up be, be getting sucked back into them. As Slovak did, Slovak just got sucked straight back into Czech and Polish for me. Um, you see, uh, do you think there is any value in listening to podcast videos in a language you only know a handful of words in? Mm, yes, there can be value in it, in that you can get the 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 the, the, the rhythm and, and and the 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 melody, the porosity of language for sure. Um, but only do it while it's interesting for you. Be very conscious of uh, if your brain starts to switch off the language and treat it as white noise that you're not going to hear. So just be conscious of that. But it, there can be listening out for those words and other words that you might understand that might be in co you might have in common with the other languages you speak. Um, but yeah, um, it's not it's not something I would say do lots and lots of that because it, comprehensible inputs better than than doing incomprehensible input for sure is it closer to czech than russian oh for um for ukrainian so it feels when i hear it it feels like there's kind of like uh words that are slits more similar to the eastern um slavic languages like russian or uh, belarusian uh, but then there are certain forms that that feel for me personally the certain sounds that feel more western slavic um but it's kind of it's it's what the language on the border for me of the two sides of the of those two sides of slavic languages that's how it feels to me and um but that's just a very personal view uh thank you for answering my question you're very welcome um okay uh, I watch your videos every love your video your channel. Thank you very much, Jorge. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Um as I, you're speaking to him, honestly, a lot of people on can't be, <laughs> uh, um, can you speak Romanian? I can speak a little bit of Romanian, yeah. Um so I lived in Moldova for a time and I, I learned Romanian and Russian um a lot there. Uh so I it's been I don't speak Romanian very often so nowadays I find it hard to to just speak but um but yeah da vorbesc românește am lucrat am lucrat la Chișinău și pentru viața mea la Moldova am 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 vorbit și limba română cu în în oraș și um, con oamenii în România, în România și uh, din Moldova. Și um, in, in Macedonia um, avem uh, și persoane uh, uh, cu limba aromanești, 
și ești o limbă foarte, foarte frumos la fel. Uh, dacă am, ba, am spus puțin uh, românește cu uh, persoana a, rum- a românește uh, din Macedonia și, um, și, și înțeleg bine cu limba română uh, din, din Moldova, uh, limba românește. Yeah, uh, okay. She's your wife a polyglot as well. She speaks, yeah, she speaks about five or so languages, yeah. Um, uh, we, we met, um, we met in, in we, we, we met many years ago when I was um, on a tour of the Balkans. Um, I don't know, Rana, what Richard is. Uh, okay, I'm curious about your thoughts. I find, I find that I do better learning a language through textbooks on all the sorts okay do you have any way of finding textbooks that are useful without spending too much money uh difficult so they cost more money lately than they did before um so finding tech i mean i have lots and lots of textbooks here and i'm very lucky to to have acquired them over a long period of time but yeah i mean i used to use in the uk when i was when i was in the uk um i would use uh the oxfam shops second hand bookshops ebay the library yeah the library's a good a good one there uh run um the library yeah things like that uh would would be really helpful to find things um but i used to scour the the, the secondhand bookshops all the time so yes there we go anyway i better go because it's um 11 minutes uh 11 minutes over where i normally am uh with this remember put some questions on patreon i'll, I'll really say um and a call to ask for questions and thoughts and things that you have on patreon um after this call uh after this video and you're very very welcome to go there to to ask questions and i will start prioritizing questions that are raised there um on the videos and also topics that are raised and in case any of you are wondering this thing on my arm is um for march it's a typical thing that's done uh in this part of the world uh I, this is actually from bulgaria So this is a martinica um, and you basically put it on and when you buy it when i bought this one for example in bulgaria uh the lady who sold it to me uh said to me zdrave i kismet which is kind of zdrave is health and kismet is um it's like yeah well we have kismet actually in english <laughs> so it means that uh, but it's kind of like look um but yeah kismet kismet um kismet uh and you wear this around march basically because march is the month called baba marta which is like like grandma march and uh, it can be different weathers and different things so you kind of wear this and then what a lot of people do then after they've been wearing them they they tie them to a tree so you often see these these um as they say in martenica or martinki martinka in, in macedonian um you then tie them to trees and um yeah it's quite it's quite cute i i, I like these little traditions that, that we have um so um yeah the patreon if you want to join then um have a look for the link on i think it's just like speaking fluently so patreon.com forward slash speaking fluently you can find it um And I'll put the link in the video on YouTube as well. So I will uh, add all of that stuff in and I will look forward to hearing from you soon and to, um, yeah, and to getting, uh, oh, oh, it's Martis in Greek. Oh, thank you. I didn't know. Do you know, I've never seen it in Greece, actually. I've only ever seen it in, I usually see it in Bulgaria, mostly. In Bulgaria, it's really big. Tot volgende keer. Ja, tot volgende keer. Doei, doei. And I will see you all next week. Happy language learning. Take care of yourselves. And I will look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.